so a very good evening to all those who have joined us and to of course good morning to some of you who have joined in from the other time zones i am shomabha bondopadhyay the governance facilitator for the garn youth hub and today we have with us subin sundar raj who is for me personally the person behind making me interested and introducing me to rights of nature and it is such a pleasure to have him for a very special and a different kind of interaction that we envisage where we will be discussing about what is the situation of rights of nature in india at present his journey in this entire process and how he looks at it after having done a voluminous research on this both doctrinal as well as empirical and his book on earth jurisprudence is something that as a law practitioner as a student of law and also as a rights of nature practitioner i always refer to and that is one book to go to whenever we refer it to the students of law and the students of rights of nature and earth jurisprudence so personally for me when i teach the course at the university here national university of juridical sciences kolkata the the entire course has been developed having been inspired from subin sundar raj and of course the book that is probably and sir can correct me if i'm wrong the only book in india written by an indian author on rights of nature so it is such a pleasure to have with us manjuri subin sundar raj who is also the expert with the un harmony with nature and is an assistant professor at christ university in india so thank you very much for making out time for us and joining us despite the busy schedule at this late in the evening and thank you very much for agreeing to do this talk and of course inspiring many many more people who would be listening to this discussion of ours thank you very much somba i think the pleasure is all mine and i think some of the things which you did say uh, i really don't deserve <laughs> not at all sir not at all <laughs> so so i think uh, to begin this interaction i would start by asking you the very first question something that i of course personally have heard from you but for the larger audience how did you or where was that break even point where you felt that there, this something needs to change or there is something which is which is there which i have to search for and that's how you came across rights of nature and then you were well uh, if i were to say something about uh, my journey as far as rights of nature is concerned i think it all started in 2009 i was doing my llm back then and uh, the teacher my human rights teacher we we were having a lot of discussion as regards the role of religion as far as environmental protection is concerned now when we started discussing about the role of religion and i did have some like minded friends along with me and we did have a chance to visit a few sacred groves in and around the locality so we thought that well uh, some of the journeys that we did undertake to many a place did bring us uh, or did bring to light a number of instances wherein you do see environmental protection is a completely different scenario i mean here on one side you have all the laws that are there which speak about environmental law environmental protection and then you do see uh, none of these laws working well yes you do have cases you do have instances of the law being used you do have environmental protection being fostered but has it really been able to change the way in which people look at law has it really been able to imbibe in people the very notions of environmental protection well we thought no so that was one of those uh, starting points as far as my personal journey is concerned and when i had a chance to discuss some of these aspects with my guide uh, my llm teacher well she was very happy about it she said well why don't we look into some of these specific instances of uh, religion being used as a tool for environmental protection and that's where it all started so if i can really point out some of those instances which i had a chance to look into my 
uh, dissertation during my master's degree. Uh, what I did was I tried to look into various facets as far as religion is concerned, uh, looked into some of those principles, uh, tried to highlight as to whether these religious principles could actually help man understand nature better. And as a result of his understanding, uh, predict nature better. So that's where it all started. And once I did uh, submit my dissertation, please do note that I only got a C grade for my dissertation. Well, my guide was very happy with, the, with my work. Uh, she said that this is, uh, this is a good work, something which has not been done, at least uh, to her knowledge, in the legal field. But then obviously the external examiners were not very keen because they found that there was nothing much legal about it, though I do disagree with them. The whole point was trying to put forward some of those very notions of religious uh, tenets, which could be imbibed in law. And I don't, I don't blame them as well, because uh, I think it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was at a very nascent stage. You really did not have some of these connotations being bred into law. And I'm sure that many people were not conversant with some of those developments or the way in which you could probably connect religion, tradition, culture, and environment protection. Well, if we were to understand it in our day-to-day -day lives, probably we'll say that, well, these are the things that needs to be done. These are the things which would augur well for environmental protection. But then how do you give it some sort of a legal backing? And that exactly was my point. While trying to look into some of those religious principles, I figured out that it might not be conducive to use it in its own uh, uh, original sense, as far as environmental protection is concerned. But if it can be tweaked a bit, if it can be used in such a way, such a way so that it can probably foster people to start thinking, well, uh, I would always say that law is some sort of an external factor. Why do you follow law? Well, we follow law because we think that if we don't, and if we get caught, we'll be punished. And we also do have this feeling that, well, if I don't get caught, well, everything's okay. But religion was used as some sort of a tool to foster environmental protection, wherein the sanction that you do receive is divine. And for followers, well, there's no uh, bigger punishment than divine sanction. So to try to connect those two lines was what I tried to do in my dis uh, dissertation. But then I'm not sure as to whether it did work at that point of time. But then nonetheless, I did keep that aspect in mind. And ultimately, it led me uh, to do my doctoral research in that particular area. So that's in short what happened. So, so as you said that, you know, uh, it was this difference that you had to constantly draw and try to uh, argue that environmental protection is very different from that of what you were proposing at that point of time. And then how you use the law, as you said, by tweaking it a little bit, how difficult was this to convince people? Well, uh, if I may say, um, when I did uh, start my journey in the legal field, one of the basic questions that I do see that I did receive was, well, what's the legal backing to this particular problem? I mean, what's the legal basis? How do you think that you can bring about some sort of a legal connotation to this very idea? You're talking about something which cannot really be said to be in the legal field. Now, when you start thinking of it in that particular way, I feel law fails. Now, what do you mean by law? Law is something which governs society, which governs societal relations, which tries to ensure that it's, there's some sort of a balance in society. Now, if law were to identify itself with the society, well, some of these very notions should also be imbibed. I'm not talking about environmental protection or environmental law in general. I'm talking about law in general. How should law be? I mean, what's the role that a law does have as far as society, a society is concerned? How do you think that law should be able to keep itself abreast with societal change? How do you think that law can really bring about a change in the way in which people start functioning uh, in a society? The mutual relationships that they do have, not just amongst themselves, but also with 
some sort of a societal structure, the state, for example. So all these put together, I felt can be achieved. And this was one way in which you could probably extend it to ensure that environmental protection also is arrived at. To convince people, well, I'm not sure whether I've been able to convince people even to this date. But then given that I had a chance to interact with a few uh, like-minded people, uh, I do feel that it has some sort of a scope. I feel that the very step that we do take in so far as uh, trying to imbibe some of these very notions of earth jurisprudence, wherein we do understand that we humans are not apart from nature, but we are a part of nature. I think that's the whole concept. I'll try to put it across in a slightly different manner. Well, think, think for example, that there's a plant, a medicinal plant. You kind of end up protecting it because you want to make sure that you use or harness those medicinal qualities. Well, we might say that this is a particular example wherein you are protecting the plant, not for its sake, but for the sake that you do receive some sort of a medicinal quality from that. Something which we humans can harness and that's why you end up protecting it. Now, irrespective of whether you whether the plant has some sort of a medicinal quality or not, you end up protecting it. I think that's what we all should be aiming at. I mean, easier said than done. Questions would arise as regards what is the role of humans then? I mean, what, what role should a human do, uh, does have? Uh, or you could also ask as to why we should be taking forth such uh, taking forward such a step now one of the basic things which i did uh, have a chance to discuss with my uh, guide during my uh, by doctoral work was that he said well if you were to think of a jurisprudence from this particular perspective uh, we do understand that nature can be left alone Nature can take care of itself. These are some of the basic ideas that we do understand, and then we do hold uh, we do do hold it to be good as well. But why don't you try to look into some of these aspects where you put forth the idea that well, even if nature can take care of itself, well and good, but with human participation, you can take care of nature better. So that's how you try to, uh, I would say, bring about a concerted effort from humans to ensure that they also do something which would augur well for environmental protection. Not because of the fact that they want to live in a healthy environment. I think that's one of the basic flaws that laws across the globe do have. We talk about it from a very anthropocentric approach wherein we say that, well, we do have a right to live in a healthy environment. You never speak about the right of environment. So that was another basic idea which we did try to delve into as far as uh, the research work is concerned. And I felt uh, probably some of those concepts of deep ecology, which I'm sure that many of you might be aware of, uh, comes to the forefront. When Arne Nees started thinking about or talking about the role that humans do have to play in so far as uh, protecting the environment is concerned, I think that's what uh, we tried to explore in, a, in my talk to you. So talking about the uh, RNAs and deep ecology, so will you, will you say that uh, when it comes to India, probably we have had, or rather we have inspired the development of rights of nature to quite an extent. Will you agree to that statement if I say so? Well, uh, let me try to uh, put it in a different uh, way. Uh, Nays was a mountaineer. I'm sure that you know about that. And how did he come to know about some of those Eastern aspects of religion and uh, culture and tradition? Well, he, along with some of his mountaineer friends, did come over to Nepal uh, to conquer the Everest. And he had a chance meeting with uh, a Sherpa, who was his guide. And then he got to know the religious connotation that this particular community did have with certain natural entities, the Himalayas also being one. And it was as a result of his 
interactions with the local people over there in Nepal, wherein uh, they did try to appraise him of the role that this, these national entities did have in their daily lives, that he got to realize that, well, uh, natural entities are looked at from a very different perspective over here. They are revered. And I think that started off his uh, thought process. And he brought about this connection of, uh, a, I would say, a human nature symbiosis, which ultimately led to deep ecology. So uh, strictly answering your question, I would say that many of those principles which we do uh, understand to be Western in view, can, to a large extent, uh, be attributed to some of those occidental uh, thinkings which we do have. Probably in this part of the globe, we did not attach names to it, uh, like the ones that you do have uh, in the Western counterpart. Uh, and I'm not sure whether they are properly acknowledged as well. I mean, that's, uh, I do understand that's, uh, that it's a, it's a sens sensitive matter when you talk about certain aspects not being acknowledged. I'm not, I'm not saying that there haven't been any uh, development in the Western Hemisphere as far as this particular line of jurisprudence is concerned. I mean, there are plenty. But I also do uh, want to put it on record that you do have some of these developments in this part of the globe as well, which might not be uh, in black and white on paper. So that's the basic difference that we do have. Yes. So, so exactly taking from that point that India and this part of the world has had a lot of contributions to this jurisprudence. What, according to you, was or what is it that because of which we in India or in the entire South Asia region, we still do not have those principles codified into the legal system and we do not really implement it in the laws of the country. Um, if we can just try to uh, put across uh, some sort of a connection with human rights. We don't have a con an Asian convention on human rights. Why? I think we have not been able to reach a consensus. You have a European one, you have an American one, you have an African one, but then unfortunately or fortunately, we don't have an Asian. And on a similar line, I think this particular aspect runs in different Asian countries as well. I mean, we have not been able to identify some of those very motions of uh, jurisprudence and then come out with a separate set of ideals or ideologies to follow. Uh, if you look into certain countries in Asia, I'm sure that a number of countries do have uh, jurisprudence ideals being followed. For example, in Bangladesh, you, had, you have had recent decisions where rivers are being treated as uh, uh, entities. You have steps that are being taken in East Timor. Uh, you have uh, some of those uh, principles, I would say, which are being followed <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, as far as earth jurisprudence is concerned. But to have a template per se is something which we have not been able to arrive at. Uh, cultural relativism, which exists within Asian countries, might be one of those reasons. Uh, another reason probably could be the could be the fact that we have not we, we are so culturally diverse, uh, legally diverse as well. And many of those religions that do exist in this part of the globe, uh, even if they do have some certain uh, common factors, I think we have had more differences than commonalities. And that might be, I'm not sure about this, but then I'm just thinking aloud, that might have catered to this sort of a, a difference of opinion. And even to this date, uh, we do see that uh, it has been especially countries in Latin, Latin America, South America more specifically, and many countries in Europe which have taken uh, giant strides as far as our jurisprudence is concerned. Not to forget that the United States also has taken uh, many a step as far as fostering this particular idea is concerned. And um, uh, to speak about India, I think we are at a 
stage wherein it's a, it's a kind of a standstill. Uh, we are neither we are neither here nor there, and I hope that particular uh, aspect will change as soon as possible. Yes, sir. So exactly this standstill that you mentioned, with regards to India, and uh, since we have already had the discussion earlier as to how the principles of religion, which are primarily followed in India, have had its roots into this line of jurisprudence. Yet, it is sad to see that it does not get reflected into the laws, despite the fact that religion plays a very important role in very many legal decisions of the country. So, sir, how would you or this kind of a dilemma that the Indian legal fraternity is presently in, especially the judiciary. What would you say? On one hand, the religion plays an important role in shaping judgments. And on the other, when it comes to this line of jurisprudence, religion, which is spoken so much about this in depth, somehow never gets featured. See, um, when I was doing my uh, master's uh, thesis, my dissertation. Uh, while I was looking into some of those religions which did have uh, certain tenets which fostered environmental protection, one of those aspects which did come to light was that there were few religions which were more environmental conscience, conscious than the other, than others. For example, Jainism, Buddhism. If you look into uh, these religions, I do feel that they did to a certain extent, have some sort of an affinity uh, towards nature, which we do not see on a similar level in other religions. I mean, I'm being very uh, diplomatic when I speak about religion. And these principles that were present in Jainism or Buddhism, for example, did cater to better environmental protection. I think the way in which they conceived nature, the way in which they thought that nature is something that should be protected, the way in which they understood that humans are a part of nature, humans need to do certain activities which would augur well for nature. I think all did roll together and then form a way of living. If you look into certain tenets of Hinduism also, I would say that it's more of a way of life. I mean, that's the common connotation that we do have uh, here in India, wherein we talk about this not being a religion per se, but rather being a way of life. Now, in many of these principles, you do understand and realize that people unknowingly follow these principles, religious tenets, which did help them do certain activities, which were more environment friendly. For example, taking care of plants and trees, adding or uh, attaching some sort of a religious value to it, not only just uh, not only trees, but also to certain animals too. We uh, consider some of these animals to be vehicles of gods and goddesses. We use many of these trees, flowers for doing certain religious activities. So all these rolled together could have, I'm saying could have, paved a way to ensure that, well, these aspects, these entities are being protected. Now, if you look into certain Western religions, I would say that the concept was a little bit different. Now, why do I say that? You do understand that man was treated as the central aspect in some of these religions. And the environment and everything that it had to offer was to be used, made use by humans. Now, everything that was present on earth was to be used by humans and you had some sort of a control. I mean, many of those religious principles, many of those uh, tenets that you did have in certain religions did put forth this line of thought. I mean, everything's there for you. Why don't you make use of it? Yes, there should be some sort of a control. Yes, 
it is not that you do have some sort of an unrestricted right to use some of these resources but the idea was to put forth that well everything's here for you i hope you got the difference now this kind of a difference that was very much present in certain religions did pave the way to man exploiting nature now think about it from a, a slightly different perspective in earlier times i mean really long time back man didn't know as to what was happening in nature i mean he feared nature some of those uh, common things that we do find lightning thunder for example i mean man at an earlier point of time did not know as to what these were and that was one of those aspects wherein he was forced to attach some sort of a divinity to nat nature nature natural processes now maybe with uh, the passage of time he got to realize some of these uh, happenings understood the very basis of it and the aura that you did attach to nature natural processes was lost and that was the stage wherein he started making use of these aspects make, making use of those uh, i would say how do i put it making use of all those gifts from nature and started controlling nature so once nature lost its its divinity you had man exert control and you kind of uh, started exploiting it coming back to our roots coming back to understand that we need protect some of these very aspects of nature coming back to realize that we should not be working against nature which in turn is supporting us i think is uh, a lesson that we all do need to learn and with the advent of uh, some of those steps that have been taken across the globe especially as far as promoting earth jurisprudence is concerned i think uh, we have come a long way um i would also i think i would have spoken about this to you earlier as well there's this movie called as baraka not uh, i hope you do recall that which tries to bring about this connection that man had with nature something which we did have long time back which we did lose somewhere in between and which we are trying to regain i think this whole journey uh, takes us a complete circle through a complete circle wherein we are able to identify what our role is what our responsibilities are where we made a mistake and uh, i would say correct this grave mistake that we did make as well and i would also like to point out the fact that well uh, we might be fighting a losing battle i think we are uh, a few more generations well uh, i'm not sure whether uh, humans would uh, still be on uh, planet earth but then uh, whatever that we are doing currently as far as earth jurisprudence or uh, trying to protect the earth for its own sake is just uh, i would say postponing the inevitable something which i think uh, we uh, should be doing that's the least i think that we can do for mother nature so so as you said that the, it is the least that we can do for mother nature with regard to india and the, all those advocates and to be advocates who are the ones who would be interpreting or help the judges interpret the laws what would your message be as to how could we probably do that tweaking as you said in using the laws and making sure that we can have what we are trying to protect that is mother nature uh if you were to look into the indian legal system i think the right to live in a healthy environment is something which we have all uh, very conversed about but this right is not there in the indian constitution if you look into the indian constitution you do find that well it speaks about article 21 it speaks about the right to life and personal liberty and we have tried to use it as some sort of a repository of rights wherein you read into it a number of other rights 
So it's not a constitutionally guaranteed right per se. I would say that this is some sort of an, uh, a judicial interpretation of Article 21. Article 21, what, well, what does it say? No person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty, save as except provided by law. Where's the right to live in a healthy environment there? Well, it's not there. And with the passage of time, with a number of cases uh, putting forth different ideas, well, judges read into Article 21 the right to live in a healthy environment and a number of other rights as well. And in India, we do find a number of decisions uh, which are being rendered by judges falling back on religious texts, uh, culture, tradition, trying to bring about some sort of a connection and environmental protection also uh, was done in this particular fashion. Now, if I were to uh, speak about some of those very steps, baby steps, uh, which were taken as far as the Indian legal system is concerned, uh, way back uh, in the 1970s, when we started uh, really thinking about environmental protection, when our Prime Minister, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, in, the 19, in 1972, when she attended the Stockholm conference, and then came back, well, we brought about a lot of changes. We brought about certain constitutional amendments as well, wherein you read into the constitution specific duties to protect the environment. Uh, a directive principle of state policy, which ensured that the state also has a certain role and responsibility as far as environmental protection is concerned. And you had you have had a number of judgments also being passed during that point of time, which spoke at length about the right to live in a healthy environment. Now, all said and done, if you were to look into some of these judgments, you do understand that Article 21 has been, I would say, uh, beaten uh, black and blue to include a number of different rights and the right to live in a healthy environment was one. It was a purely anthropocentric approach, a human centric approach. You spoke about protecting the environment because you need to protect the environment. You need to live in a healthy environment. So it was obviously to protect your right that the environment is being protected. It is not protected for its own sake, which I would say uh, is wrong. Uh, given our understanding of our jur jurisprudence, we do understand and we do cater to a view which should be a purely ecocentric approach. Now, attaining those ecocentric principles might be a tough uh, thing, but then nevertheless, we have had numerous instances of decisions and steps being taken in India, which promote this line of, uh, this line of thought. I would say that, uh, as I was pointing out earlier, many of those cultural and traditional practices that were present in India were sought to be given some sort of a legal recognition. I mean, every now and then you've had instances of judges falling back on a religious text, for example, and saying that, well, this is what has been said in the religious text. This is the reason why you need to protect the environment. This is the reason why you need to protect a particular tree or a plant or say an animal. Uh, you Judges were not able to bring about a direct legal connection, but I would say that it was more of a, 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 a cultural and a traditional connection that they tried to weed into. And clubbing it with Article 21, the right to live in a healthy environment, you had a decision being brought about, which ultimately would be beneficial as far as environmental protection is concerned. But then somewhere down the line, you had instances of judges also reading into the law the very reason as to why certain national entities were to be protected. They started uh, saying, or resorting to some of these religious principles, which said that, well, natural entities are manifestations of gods or goddesses. Rivers, for example, that was one of the first instances. Now, when you attach this kind of a, a divinity to some of these natural entities, which has been quoted in many a judgment, and then you do say that, well, it has to be protected. You are trying to tinker with this particular idea. Well, a religious sanction would have, in most circumstances than not, uh, more followers, more takers than a legal sanction. I mean, we are all afraid of this divine sanction. I think that could be one of the very reasons why judges fell back on these customs and traditions and said that, well, you're supposed to protect 
uh, some of these national entities. Uh, and throughout history, throughout many a judgment, you do see this kind of an approach being taken. And I would say that all of this culminated in certain decisions, especially the Mohammed Salim uh, decision, uh, which was taken uh, by the Uttarakhand High Court, wherein they gave some sort of legal status to uh, the Ganga and the Yamuna, which are uh, considered holy. And uh, though the matter has been stayed by the Supreme Court of India, uh, citing administrative problems. I mean, what happened in the High Court decision was that apart from attaching some sort of a legal uh, status to these rivers, uh, certain uh, governmental officials were uh, appointed as guardians of the rivers, of these rivers. Now, these rivers, they um, are not restricted to a particular state. And the matter when it was placed, when it was heard before the Supreme Court, it was pointed out that, well, uh, having a certain state's government, uh, governmental representative being appointed as guardians will not work and they will not be able to perform their duties in, say, another state. That was one of the uh, administrative problems that was raised and the matter was uh, stayed by the Supreme Court. Nevertheless, you've had a few other decisions as well. For example, in, uh, I think in Lalit Miglani, uh, that was the second decision that was rendered after the Mohammed Salim case, wherein you've had uh, numerous national entities, rivers, glaciers, and whatnot being afforded legal status. Uh, you've had uh, cases uh, wherein the animal kingdom was held to be, uh, I mean, held to possess some of these rights uh, in Karnail Singh, uh, in the Karnail Singh case, in Narayanan Dutt, but case, a uh, couple of instances wherein you had this kind of an extension of rights being provided to animals. And you have also had uh, a case uh, wherein the Sukna Lake was given some sort of a legal entity status. Now, all said and done, I would say that uh, uh, these judgments were rendered by Justice Rajiv Shah. I mean, if you look into uh, some of these decisions in India, wherein uh, this particular idea was being mooted, he was the only judge who gave these, ju uh, these judgments. And unfortunately, we will not be having any more judgments because he is he's retired. Um, and the very basis for some of these judgments, I would say, was to ensure that those steps which have been taken in different parts of the globe, which did cater to rights of nature, is also being recognized in India. Now, one basic problem that I do find as far as some of these judgments are concerned was that, well, not just rights, but duties and liabilities of a human was also extended to these natural entities, which I think is a wrong way of looking at it. I would also like to bring to your attention that, uh, well, when Christopher Stone, for the very first time in 1972, uh, wrote, should trees have standing, he put forth this idea that whenever some sort of a, uh, a right of standing is extended to different entities other than humans, it is either met with ridicule or fear. I think that's the same position that we find ourselves in currently. We kind of ridicule this particular aspect, saying that, well, how are entities supposed to come to court? will speak for these entities. Well, what could we possibly gain by providing certain rights as far as these entities are concerned? I mean, it doesn't make sense. That's one part to it. The second part to it speaks about the fear aspect. What if rights are given to these entities? Well, tomorrow, can the entities claim some sort of a, a violation of their rights? quite possibly. Can the entity say that we have not, we humans have not done specific duties which you are supposed to do and then have some sort of a claim be raised against us? Well, that's a fear part of it. And I think that's the stage that we are at currently. We kind of uh, really do not want to attach this kind of a, a right to different entities of nature. 
we really do not want to protect the environment for its own sake because of the fact that we need to make use of these products of nature. We, use, we want to make use of whatever that we can gain from nature. I mean, we don't give a damn as far as environmental protection is concerned. The only concern that we do have as far as environmental protection is concerned to save ourselves. I would say that it's a, 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 it's a hard and fast anthropocentric approach that we do find in each and every single activity that we indulge ourselves in. We really don't want to leave certain aspects. For example, um, I, I was the other day reading one of those studies uh, which spoke about uh, uh, wilderness areas. Now, if we were to leave a particular area as wilderness, we think of it as some sort of a, a problematic situation wherein we say that, well, we have not been able to harness some of those resources that are available there. Why do you want to leave it as it is? I mean, make use of it. We never do anything uh, which would be, which would augur well as far as protecting those areas. I think those are some of the different aspects that have been dealt with time and again by courts in India. And uh, quite recently also, there's been uh, a case that has been filed before the Supreme Court of India by uh, an NGO, the People's Charity Organization, which has sought uh, a declaration as far as the animal kingdom is concerned, as a legal entity. Now, I've also there's been numerous news reports as far as this particular case is concerned, wherein the judge, the Supreme Court judge, actually uh, asked the petitioner's advocate in open court as to what this whole thing would mean. I mean, the question was, do you say that uh, your dog is equal to you? Uh, is that what you mean? I mean, that's what you do understand as far as uh, providing legal entity status is concerned. And even though notices were sent to the uh, to different states, the judge did make, an, uh, make a reference in open court and said that, well, this is a plea that is highly uh, unlikely to be entertained. Now, given this kind of a step that we do have currently in India, I think uh, despite some of those high court decisions which do cater to the earth jurisprudence principles, we have not been able to imbibe the very spirit and ethos behind protecting nature for itself. Rights of nature is a concept that is still on paper, something that has not been able to uh, be translated into action. And I think it's high time that courts in India take a definite step and follow some of those various examples that we do have across the globe uh, in different countries and ensure that the same is being replicated here in India as well. I mean, if you were to look into some of those different um, steps taken in various parts of the globe, you can either have a constitutional provision like the one that you do have in Ecuador. You can have a specific legislation like the one that you do have in Bolivia. You can have an entity to entity specific right, like the one that you do have in New Zealand. So you do have numerous examples and ways in which rights of nature are being bred into the legal system. And I think it's only a matter of time before the Indian court also, Indian courts also do recognize this particular right and take enough and more steps to reach into the Indian legal system some of these rights. And as I did point out earlier, these are things which are not foreign to us. We do have numerous instances of, uh, I would say, a community nature symbiosis which exists in India. I'll give a few, few examples. Sacred groves, I think, is something that has been very prevalent in India. And there have been states in India which have come up with specific programs as far as protecting sacred groves are concerned. Uh, a policy. I mean, good for a start. Uh, you do have uh, resources being protected in a slightly different manner. For example, if I can uh, speak about Pani Panchayats, certain steps that were prevalent in states of in the state of Maharashtra, wherein you do have community participation 
which try to ensure that resources are protected. So this fall, I mean, this brings me back to one of those ideas which I did say my professor did put forth. I mean, nature can take care of itself, but why don't you just lend it a helping hand? I mean, that's that's something that you could possibly do. You being a part of nature, we humans being a part of nature, that's the least that you can do. So some of these aspects wherein you can read into uh, law certain communitarian practices which augur well for nature, give it some sort of a legal backing, give it some sort of uh, maybe a recognition. Well, if we do that, if we try to harness this particular duty aspect, well, that would be the best way out. And I, I would say that it's, it's, it's a human thing. I mean, uh, I always do this particular exercise in class as well. I ask them, I ask uh, my uh, students as to what your fundamental rights are. And I'll have answers from every part of the room. I mean, it would be like uh, a number of answers popping up uh, at the very same time. You ask them what their fundamental duties are. Well, the rate at which the answers uh, uh, are given would be a bit on the lower side. And I tell them that, well, you know your rights, but then you don't know your duties. I think it's all to do with the human psyche. You're more concerned about your rights. You're more concerned about what you need to get, but then you're not really uh, conversant or really, you don't want to know as to what you should be giving back. So if you're really concerned about your duties, if you are able to harness this particular duty that you do have, wherein you're supposed to protect the environment for its own sake, ensure that there are certain communitarian practices that are taken, which would augur well for environmental protection, give it some sort of a like legal backing, I mean, if possible, or at least come up with some sort of policy which would ensure that, well, these are recognized. There's something in black and white. Well, I think that would go a long way as far as environmental protection is concerned. In its truest sense, I'm not saying that the environment is not protected at all. Well, we are protecting the environment. We have a number of laws. But are we protecting it in its truest sense? Well, I think that's the difference that a jurisprudence should be able to make as far as not just India, but then across the world. Yes, absolutely. You just took uh, us through the journey of the Indian judiciary as to how it began with a lot of uh, making a lot of difference and contributing to this line of jurisprudence and to how finally we are at that standstill and we still remain at that. But one encouraging aspect about you personally has been the fact that despite being from a country which has, which progressed a little bit, but then it has not really done much, you happen to be representing at the UN Harmony with Nature. So coming to that, how is the experience and how is it when it comes to this entire or this, this different representative capacity? How is it and what is it like? It's something that we are really interested to know from you. Well, uh, uh, as I was pointing out earlier, I think it's based on the doctoral work that I did that I had a chance to uh, e-meet some of those uh, giants as far as earth jurisprudence is concerned. I've had a chance to attend some of their talks, which later led me to have a one-on-one -on -one con conversation with them as well. And uh, some of these projects which we uh, uh, had uh, taken part as well. Now, as a result of... Uh, these meetings and these discussions that uh, we did have, I was fortunate enough to be uh, a member of the UN United Nations Harmony with Nature program, which I must say is doing a lot as far as promoting both jurisprudence ideals are concerned. Now, this being a, a, a group of like-minded people, academicians, practitioners, and anyone uh, uh, in any field having some sort of an interest as far as urges is concerned, I think it provides a platform wherein you are able to share your views and ideas, wherein you are able to take part in uh, conferences and put forth your thoughts in a, a clear-cut fashion, wherein you are able to engage in certain grassroots level initiatives, which have ultimately 
led to resolutions and laws being passed. I think that's where it all boils down to. I mean, unless, of course, we spread the message, nothing's going to happen. And we at the United Nations Harmony with Nature are, I would say, a bent to bring about this change, uh, taking part in grassroots level initiatives, trying to bring in more people uh, together, uh, to make them aware of some of these rights, to help them in their pursuit of justice, to help them probably file cases, to have discussions, academic discussions as well. I think that's what the UN Harmony with Nature is all about. And time and again, uh, many of these uh, fellow members, they do ensure that their steps, uh, their uh, interactions with each other do cater to legal developments in some part of the global level. And you might have instances of, say, um, uh, in a particular country, wherein you do have certain aspects of rights of nature being discussed, being uh, brought to the fore by one of these members. We have a lot of discussion on this particular aspect and see as to whether we would be able to provide some sort of a jurisprudential basis as far as promoting these rights are concerned and helping this particular country in realizing some of these goals. I think that's what we all do. Uh, so it's more or less uh, an academic uh, work, some sort of research-oriented work. And uh, in short, uh, as I was pointing out earlier, spreading the word. We need more people to be aware of this particular right because that's what uh, we all should be uh, aiming at. Thank you so much for giving us that little uh, hint as to what is going on and how the UN has taken up this pro project and, and it, it's doing so much because UN is all about the consensus of the nations. And when it comes on board to take up this project, it probably gives a lot of boost even to people like you who are the, the only member from this country, from this part of the world or, or India who is still uh, fighting and striving despite the fact that the legal scenario is very, very gloomy and it's still not very certain. So I think uh, thank you to you for representing India and representing all the little people who are here, all those little groups of people who are in pockets of the country in India who are trying to work for rights of nature and trying to really make a little bit of differences, like for me, like personally, who is trying to do that. And from that level, the last question that I would ask you is what would you, according to you, be the role of the Garn Youth Hub, considering that we deal with the youth of the world, all over the world. So according to you, what would your message be to the Youth Hub, which we as facilitators of the Youth Hub can take up and can maybe progress better in, I mean, across all the countries. And of course, for these countries where the rights of nature is still an ongoing process or work in progress. The simple thing is you catch them young. Um, uh, what you could possibly do, and uh, I think what we all should be doing, is to spread the word. Uh, the earlier, the better. And if we are able to conduct some sort of uh, probably legal literacy uh, camps on those lines, if we are able to catch hold of uh, children, make them aware that there are certain aspects of environmental protection. I mean. Uh, I would, I, I'm not talking about the very uh, legal basis as far as environmental protection is concerned. Maybe through stories, through anecdotes, through uh, our experiences, we just convey it in uh, a form which they would resonate with. They'll be able to identify it in a better fashion. And if we are able to probably instill this notion of environmental protection in them, in these young minds. I think that's where it all uh, can have a beautiful start from. You create the next generation who are uh, a set of people 
uh, whom uh, a set of people who I would say would be uh, uh, definitely facing a lot of problems than what we are currently facing. But then it's, uh, a set of people who would also be aware that action is to be taken. And this is the line of approach that has to be followed as well. So we, in our childhood, probably we did not uh, experience some of these problems that we uh, do, I mean, some of these problems that are currently being faced by this particular generation. Uh, we are lucky in that sense. And I would say that if we are able to really put forth this particular idea, if we are able to ensure that this message is being spread amongst the younger generation so that they also take enough and more steps to ensure that, well, their activities don't really affect nature or to a certain, uh, or I would say, they kind of, there's a certain limit which they can keep in mind and which they will not uh, cross as well as far as uh, nature, nature conservation is concerned. So just spreading the word, I think, would be the best way out, the best possible solution as far as promoting rights of nature is concerned. And I'm sure that the, uh, uh, the Ghan Youth Hub would definitely be doing it in a number of countries. And uh, maybe specific activities uh, in developing countries and underdeveloped countries uh, could be given more thrust. Because those might be the countries wherein you might have certain uh, lackadaisical steps present as far as environmental protection is concerned. So, yeah. So that's what probably can could be done. Thank you so much, sir, for giving us that those pointers to work on and the fact that it is all about spreading the information and spreading what this movement is all about. And at the Youth Hub, that is what we are trying to do. And it is primarily because of that we conduct such uh, sessions and discussions. We have a book club, which is there wherein we are discussing regularly on different scholarly writings of uh, very many authors from across the world who are working just not in the legal field, but also maybe in other, other, uh, other fields where their work relates to rights of nature. So that, these are the little things we are trying to do when trying to, as you said, get them young. So that is what we are trying to do. Thank you so much, sir, for, for sparing some time for us and uh, discussing, sharing your journey with us and giving us so many different pointers to think on and also to keep working. And also, of course, shedding, the, shedding light into the broader picture as to how Indian legal system, the judiciary primarily, has to, as you said, work a lot more. And that includes just not the judges, but also the advocates and the other ancillary factors who are in place so that we too can progress because we see other countries who are progressing, who, have, who took this step much later than India, but we are still in that work in progress mode. And probably, we, as you said, that we will, see a day where we are not in that standstill position anymore and that we we also can say that yes the supreme court of india has finally declared rights of nature is a legal possibility in india thank you very much sir for inspiring us always and thank you for doing this work relentlessly representing India at the UN Harmony with Nature. Thank you very much. And of course, hoping to have you for many more sessions. And of course, we would be bothering you personally and also as the Youth Hub for several projects that we would like to do. Thank you very much for having this discussion. Thank you so much. The pleasure is all mine. And I think I have, uh, I mean, I'm happy to see you, uh, Girija and Ratna Priya. Uh, because I, I think, uh, see, uh, seeing all of you being a part of this uh, exercise, uh, I mean, uh, I, I come to know that at least I've been able to instill some of these aspects during our discussions. Yes. And even though it's been around uh, four years, I guess, since we last met in a classroom, 
uh, the very fact that you still hold on to this particular idea, uh, I think is appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.